The idea of preppers came out in the 50s and 60s, and some of you are here old enough to remember this. It was a, a Cold War period, a post-World War II period. It was a nuclear explosion away from being in a disaster. And so they, they prepped, and they got ready, and they had all kinds of these underground territories and things of that nature. Some of you may know people. Some of you may be those people. I don't know. The 70s and 80s were much more of a retreatist, survivalist kind of movement, but it was uh, akin to this prepper mentality. The 90s had the extremists. Then you had 9-11, which did not help. You had Katrina. You had the Great Recession. You had COVID. We, we have all these things. And the question kept coming up, are you ready for the end? Are you going to be ready? Are you prepared? And National Geographic came out with Doomsday Preppers. It's a show highlighting those that are prepping for Doomsday. And, you know, there's all kinds of us that are naysayers and go, those weirdos. I mean, if we're honest, many of us might think that. But if a nuclear holocaust comes, they're going to be more prepared than I am. Except that I've got Jesus and I'm not really concerned about it. Are you prepared? Are you ready? These are important questions for us. And so let's unpack a few of those as we turn to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to look starting in verse 3. Sometimes as you... Uh, we're told yet last week by Dr. Taylor, this is sometimes called the Olivet Discourse because he is on the Mount of Olives and he is discoursing with them. So in verse 3, let's just walk through these and then I'll give us three applications at the end, okay? While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, now, why are they coming to talk to him? Why, do they, why are they concerned? Because he just talked about the temple being destroyed. Now that's going to happen. It's going to happen in A.D. 70. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be completely destroyed because of the war that will be going on. That's not this moment. This is 30, 40 years prior to that. Okay? And so they, they said, tell us, when will these things happen? Isn't that a question we all would like an answer to? Jesus, I believe you're coming back. Praise God. Jesus is coming back. When are you coming back? You know, to me, that's kind of like wanting to know your death date. Right? Uh, we all know our birth date. None of us know our death date. And there's a, a, some people are re, just, man, I wish I would know. I don't, I don't really want to know that. Now, sometimes preachers will pose the question, if today were your last day, would you act differently knowing that than not? And if you would act differently knowing it's your last day, maybe that's how we ought to be acting every day. Why? Because we don't know when he's coming back. Every generation, every century, nearly every decade, we ha can look back across time and say, well, that could be, that should have been the time, that could have been the time, and everybody in those moments are going, this has got to be the time, and some of you have said it also in the last five to ten years. My goodness, this, how much worse can it get? I mean, we've read the Bible, we know what some of the things are going to be happening and we can pinpoint things and we can go, man, that and that and that. Oh goodness, that and... Lord, when? It's the same question the disciples had. When, it, when is this going to happen? What is the sign of your coming and of the end of the... They were full of questions, weren't they? And Jesus replied to them in verse 4. Classic Jesus. He doesn't answer them really. Does he? Watch out that no one deceives you. 
Don't be deceived. Got a lot of that going on, don't we? When we read through these next few verses, people will come to your mind, events are going to come to your mind, thoughts are going to come to your mind. All that seem to suggest, wow, we're prime for His return. The, this, this world, this world is prime for His return. Yes, it is. And in the same way that Paul and the apostles lived every day with the expectation that in their lifetime He's going to return, so has every generation since. Now, I had statistics. I was a math minor in college and I've run some statistics and those of you that know statistics will understand what I'm about to say. The longer that he tarries, the more likely, more probable it is for his return to be next. That's just statistical theory. The longer you wait, the more likely it is to happen. We've been waiting, and every generation, every time, every place has said the same thing. It does not water it down, and it does not make it less than. In fact, it makes it more than. Jesus could come back now. And some of us are scared about that. And the thing is, sometimes we're scared about that because we know we may not be spiritually prepared for that. Down deep in the midst of our emotional center, we know we're not ready. And sometimes we're not mentally ready or we're not emotionally ready. We've got unfinished business in our life. I suggest you get it finished. Because we don't know. Don't be deceived, he says. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Messiah. And they will deceive many. That's happened. It does happen. It is happening. For the record, I am not that. I am not the Messiah. Don't claim to be the Messiah. There's just one of those. And we worship Him, and He died for us, and He was buried for us, and He rose again for us. His name is Jesus. He's the Messiah. And He has gone to be at the right hand of the Father, and there comes a day when He's going to return to take us all home. For those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So you have a beginning. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. How well are we doing at that? You hear of wars and rumors of wars, and, and man, we are awash with fear. Well, is it coming here? Is it coming there? What kind of wars? Is it this war? Well, is this the war or that the war? And we watch the news, we listen to the news, and we get all kinds of scared. Our hope is in Jesus, not the latest news cycle. Let's, re let's keep that in, the, in our mind. See that you are not alarmed because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation. Many, many, many people thought World War I was the end. This verse. It's got to be the end. When the peace treaty came out and everybody went home and they redivided everything and everything settled down, a whole lot of people lost their religion. Because I thought that was the end. But it clearly says the end's not yet. They're going to rise up against the kingdom against kingdom. World War II came. Still didn't happen. And that's just in our lifetimes and, and family lifetimes. Not, 
not way back when, that's, that's now. Then you had the Gulf War. Then you have basically an ongoing world war that we don't talk about all the time. There, there's a war going on all the time that carries much of our world with it. We may not be in it, but we're in it. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Syria, Turkey, major things going on. All these events are the beginning of the labor pains. Now I think it's important for us to note right here that our view of time and God's view of time are not the same view. Okay? We think of things very straightforward, very linear, very logical, and very one right after the other, and go this and this and this, and boom, here it is. God doesn't hold to that same time frame as we do. The beginning of labor pain the beginning of it it's not the end it's not even the middle it's just the beginning how long is the beginning we don't know because our version of beginning middle and end typically runs longer than God's version of beginning middle and end I mean the psalmist said what a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day But it's the beginning. You say, well, we've been in the beginning for a long time. Yes. Yes, we have. Then there's a middle point, verse 9. Then they will hand you over to be persecuted, and they will kill you. Anybody remember a few years ago on a beach in Egypt where several Christians were shot and it was put out on YouTube? You realize that Christians around our world die every day for their faith. We are very protected here. And we cry and we whine about the lack of our religious liberties and they're taking away our rights. And they may be. I'm not going to argue the point with you today. But my friends, we do not have it like 90% of the world has it. Dying daily. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away. Betray one another. And hate one another. Wow. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many because lawlessness will multiply. The love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This is one of the first responsibilities we have, isn't it? That you've heard in this description so far from Jesus. To endure. And we're going to get to that in a second. Verse 14. This is where we get toward when is the end. This good news, the gospel, will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations. And what's it say next? And then the end will come. Have you ever considered our responsibility in the bringing of the end? The good news will be proclaimed to all the world. And then the end will come. Have we ever stopped to consider the possibility? We understand that Jesus in the Great Commission commanded us and commissioned us to take and to make disciples of what? Of all the nations, right? Have you ever connected that back to this? That the responsibility is on us. 
And all Christians, we have the responsibility. Have we ever stopped to consider that God is tarrying for us to, con- to fulfill our part of this responsibility? It's possible. He is gracious and kind. I mean, goodness gracious, how many years we see He suffered and was patient with Israel in the Old Testament. How long He's been patient with us in our problems and sin. The Lord doesn't want any to perish, but He wants all to come to the saving faith in Christ. So, we have a responsibility in this. Well, then he goes in verse 15 to 28 and basically walks through a beginning, middle, and end again. So he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now, this fleeing to the mountains is not out of fear, Because how could that be if he just stated what he said in verse 14, that we're supposed to be expressing the good news. So they are fleeing out of a sense of faith. In the same way, I feel, that Paul would, would say, look, if they don't, or Jesus would tell his disciples, if they don't accept you, shake the dust off your feet and move on to another town. When this comes... And this is historically the parousia that, that, that had them all escape out of Jerusalem. Where did they go? They scattered. And in scattering, they took their faith with them. And in scattering and taking their faith with them, they led other people to Jesus and planted other churches. And actually the movement multiplied under persecution instead of dying under persecution. So my friends... While we don't want to be flippant about a persecution that may come to America, and let me rephrase that, the persecution that's going to come here, while we don't want to be flippant about that, and we don't want to just throw that away, and we don't want to say, oh, well, and oh, shucks, we want to recognize it for what it is, but my friends, the church is at her best when she's under pressure. Because that's when we get desperate for the presence of God. When everything is fine and right and nobody's really pressing us, it's really easy for us to just sit back and say, it's all good. And the church falters in those moments. She does best under pressure. A man on the housetop must not come down to get things out of his house, and a man in the field must not go back to get his quote. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. I mean, traveling, wow, it's it's not easy. Then he, he says, pray that your escape may not be in winter because the bad weather and the lack of roads would be horrible. You try, pray that it's not in the winter. Pray that it's not on the Sabbath when, when gates would be closed and you could not leave or enter places. For at that time, there will be great distress, the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now and never will again. Unless those days were cut short, no one would be saved. But those days will be cut short because of the elect. And uh, this idea of the days being cut short, this tribulation is the term used, not It's just a a term of bad times and difficult times and pressure times. But unless those days were cut short, it's either because of our doing what we're supposed to be doing or it is for us. And either way is a beautiful, gracious gift of God. So then, if anyone tells you, see, here's the Messiah, or over here, Don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will arise, perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. And that is referencing those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Take note. I have told you in advance. So, if they tell you, see, he's here in the wilderness, don't go out there. 
Or, look, he's in the storerooms. Don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will gather. The false prophets will come and, and establish identity and signs and authority and say, this is who we are. And Hey, you need to go see this person and all these other things. And he said, look, I've told you, don't be deceived. I've told you in advance. My return, what he's ultimately saying there at the last couple of verses, my return's not going to be in secret. You're not just going to wake up one day and somebody's going to text you and say, hey, I saw the Messiah today. Why don't you come see him too? Not happening in that way. It is going to be well announced. 1 Thessalonians 4. And the trumpet of the Lord will sound and he will come. He will break open the eastern sky and he's using language here like the lightning flashes across the sky and everybody in the area knows that he's not coming in secret. He's coming openly. And everybody will know when he's here. There will be no doubt. There will be no misunderstanding. Because there's only one Messiah, and when He comes, the whole world's going to know it. And my friends, I will suggest to you that if it takes a news cycle time frame for the whole world to know that the Messiah has come, that's not the real Messiah. Because my God who created the whole universe can do things we cannot physically comprehend. That my God will send His Son, Jesus Christ, and everybody around the world's going to know it. I love the fact that if the flat earth movement cannot be debunked in any other way, it's this way. Because I love the fact that God created it round so that He, when He comes, everybody's going to know it and there's no way anybody else can do that. Only God can do that. That people at the North Pole and the South Pole all at the same time and everybody in between can know in a shadow, in a moment, in a blink of an eye, in the flash of a lightning, He has returned. Are you ready for that? For some of you, I need to ask this question too. Are you ready for the journey between here and there? Because it's going to be a journey. And you've got to get ready We can't just sit back on our decision we made 40 years ago and say, hey, I'm all good. I got my ticket to ride. It's not about that. It's about the journey. When you gave your life to Christ by faith in what He did for you that you could not do for yourself, you began a journey with Him. You didn't say, okay, it's all done. We're good. Now we're just sitting on ready. No, you began a journey with Him. A journey that's going to take you through many of the things that we have just read about from Jesus Himself. So what do we need to do to be prepared? What does it mean then, if I'm going to be prepared, what does it mean for me to be a prepared follower of Christ? Well, first of all, you have to be a follower of Christ. And I've said this two times already. I'm going to say it again. I'm probably going to do it one more time before we're done. If you have not honestly, sincerely, really put your faith alone in what Jesus did in His life, death, burial, and resurrection, you, for you and for your sin, all the wrong choices you've made, let's not water it down, you have sinned against a holy God. And in that sin against a holy God, no matter how small or however large, it has eliminated you from ever being with with God in heaven apart from your decision about Jesus Christ. Because you cannot save yourself. You cannot do enough good to overcome the bad. And when this stuff happens, let me tell you, and he'll say this later, the sheep and the goat thing, we're going to know who the sheep and the goats are. We're going to know who's in and who's not. We're going to know who endures and who doesn't. Because if you're not enduring and you're falling away, it may be because you never had the presence of the Spirit of God. You've never been what we say in church. You haven't been saved yet. By giving your faith 
and saying, God, I can't. I believe Jesus did that for me. I believe that. God, forgive all the guilt, forgive all the sin, forgive all the darkness and blackness. God, remove all that from me and I will give you my allegiance. I will give you my heart. I will give you my life. If you haven't done that, you're not ready. But if you have done that, there is still readiness and there's still work for us to do. Jesus hasn't come yet, so we've got work to do. So a prepared follower will exhibit endurance for an expression of the gospel. Matthew 24, 14. We will endure for the gospel and we will express the gospel. That's what we are called to do. He will wrap all that up in Matthew 28 when he says, Go into all the nations and baptize them and teach them. Make disciples of them all. To evangelize, for conversion, for discipleship and growth. The whole thing. Do that. Go and do that. We still have a job to do. Because there are still people who have not received Jesus by faith in their life. Jesus may be a good man. Jesus may be a good teacher. Jesus may be a good moralist. Jesus may be a a great prophet. But until we recognize Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God, who died for us, we are not ready. They are not ready. And it's our job to tell that. It's our job to, to enter into relationships so that we can share the gospel with them. We took a survey in the fall. The whole church, we, everybody that was willing and took it, took a survey. And out of that survey, some startling results came. First of all, 52% of the respondents did not believe that people in our church share their faith. Over half didn't believe that we share our faith. Now that's startling. 90% said that we don't offer any evangelism training. We're fixing that in two weeks. You can look in your bulletin, you can look online. We've got evangelism training coming up. Mark your calendars, put it down, show up. 90%, that's fair, that's real, that's on us. We haven't offered it in, in officially evangelism training, so we're offering that coming up. But here's the one that just took me to my knees. 65% said, even if you offer me training, I will not share my faith. we we got to do better. We have to do better. A prepared follower will endure and express the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we are called to do. Am I the greatest at it? No, I'm not. I'm right there with you. I have my struggles. I have my obstacles just like you do. But praise God, just the other day, 42 of you said, I will commit to sharing and having a gospel conversation this week and every week. Praise God for that. And I pray that we uphold that commitment. I pray that we will do that, that we'll follow through with that because we have thousands of people within 10 minutes that don't know Jesus but they know you, they know me, and we have the answers because we have Jesus. A prepared follower will also bring mercy to those around them and provide good to others. A prepared follower offers mercy Maybe it's mercy in the gospel. Maybe it's mercy in that relationship to say, how can I help you? How can I pray for you? How can I love you? How can I be good to you? A prepared follower does that because they begin to realize what has been given and that they want to give that away. Because in the difficulties that are now and and coming, we must be people of mercy. Because as it has been shown to us, we must give that away. And we can practice 
among us. Let, let, we can practice that just with those of us that are here. We can show greater mercy. We can show greater good. We can show deeper love among us. We can practice among us. So we can get accustomed to it and we can get practice to it and we can get good at it so that we can go out among everybody else and do it there too. So I encourage us to let mercy be your first response. Not judgment. We all do dumb things. Some of us just hide it more than others. Some of us internalize it. And some of us externalize it. Stories of our past. Stories of our present. Our hurts. Our problems. Our concerns. Our grief. Our fear. Our loss. Our hopelessness. Our lack of direction. Our lack of purpose. Every one of us has a story about that we don't want to be judged for what used to be so let us not judge others for what used to be either let us be merciful and kind and loving in the way Jesus was to us may we be that for others and finally a prepared follower will not be deceived by all the signs and wonders. We don't have to be stoic. We don't have to be so reserved nobody ever knows. But we don't have to get all hyped up over varieties of things. Steady and even. Loving Jesus. Showing the love of Jesus. Are you prepared? Are you prepared spiritually for the end of the world? It's coming. I don't know the day and hour. Jesus will say he doesn't know the day and the hour. When the Father says go, it's go time. Are you ready if it were today? Are you spiritually ready for eternity? Have you made that decision yet? Are you emotionally ready for the journey between now and then? Are you in a developing relationship with God through His Word? Are you developing that way? Are you mentally prepared for what's coming? Are you involved in purification and consecration? Are you involved in confession before God? Are you involved in daily reading His Word? It's not about legalism and check marks. It's about me recognizing my moment in time before a holy God and recognizing that He can come at any moment. And am I ready? Is my family ready? Are my friends ready? Are my extended group ready? Are my co-workers ready? Are they ready? Oh, but pastor, who am I to tell them? You're prepared. Or not. Now is the moment of choice. Let's pray.